Good afternoon, and welcome to Juneteenth week, a celebration of Black liberation. A series of events sponsored by Tompkins County and the city of Ithaca. I'm Ken Clark, director of the Tompkins County Office of Human Rights. This commemoration is a remembrance of the events of June 19th, 1865 when U.S. Army General Gordon Granger issued General Order Number 3, announcing to Texans that enslaved people nationwide were now free. Granger's declaration came nearly two and a half years after Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which in fact did not free slaves from the Confederate States the federal government was fighting. And one month after the last official battle of the Civil War near Brownsville, Texas, and six months before the ratification of the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. This timeline reflects what our distinguished keynote speaker described as part of the process of emancipation. Juneteenth, therefore, is an opportunity to ponder the meaning of freedom. It also reminds us of the work needed to further expand freedom as the meaning of freedom is always evolving and to preserve it. Today's keynote address will be followed on Wednesday, June 15th by another Juneteenth event. Business Leaders of Color or BLOCK will sponsor a black owned business expo at the Tompkins Center for History and Culture on Ithaca Commons. The event begins outside at 11 a.m. and ends at 2 p.m. Food from local Black-owned vendors will be available for purchase. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Anna Gordon-Reed is a historian and the Carl M. Lee Professor at Harvard. She is the author of several books and has won over 16 book prizes, including the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize in History for her book, The Hemingses of Monticello. Most recently, Gordon Reed released the New York Times bestseller on Juneteenth, telling the sweeping story of Juneteenth's integral importance to American history. Gordon Reed is also the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a MacArthur Fellowship, and the National Humanities Medal. Following her presentation, she will answer your questions uh, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube. You can submit um, your questions through the YouTube chat function. Please join me in welcoming Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I wanna say how happy I am to be able to share this time with you. It's very exciting to be able to celebrate Juneteenth as a national holiday uh, for really the first time where we had, had time to prepare for it. Uh, last year, um, the president signed the bill just before the day and it was sort of a surprise, I guess. Everything happened so quickly, but I have a feeling now that there are gonna be lots of really extensive uh, and enthusiastic celebrations around the country. I was born in Texas where these events took place and I grew up celebrating Juneteenth with my family and members of my community. I remember it as a, a community event. I grew up in a small town. I was born in a very small town and then we moved to a town that was slightly bigger than the place where I was born, Conroe, Texas. And the day was filled with family and visiting neighbors and little children running around drinking too much soda and eating too much barbecue and playing with firecrackers. It's hard for me to believe that my grandfather <laughs> that bought and gave us firecrackers and matches uh, when we were little kids, but that was a different era, a different sense of parenting in those days that we have now. I, don't, I can't see myself doing that with my kids, but that's what Juneteenth meant to me. And it was, it was um, a day for serious things. I mean, I understood, we understood what it was about, but for the kids, it was more about the play. For the adults, it was a full-fledged, I think, commemoration of the day and what it actually meant. I was fortunate enough to have my great-grandmother alive until I was about 11. I could kick myself 
for not paying more attention to the stories that she told me and not asking her more questions than I asked. But I remember her talking about Juneteenth and thinking that maybe it didn't mean as much to younger people as it should uh, mean, because it meant a great deal to her. Her mother had been enslaved, was born enslaved. Um, she was freed as a girl by, with her mother by her father, who was her owner, and thinking about the nature of what slavery was like and some of the aspects of it. So she knew a person who had been enslaved and she knew other people who had been enslaved. So that's not, if you think about it, that's not that far ago long. I mean, I knew my grandmother who knew someone who had been enslaved and other people who'd been enslaved. So that's, this is really close. And we think about this as something that happened a long time ago. It's not really a long time ago in history. And as other people have pointed out, African-American people were enslaved in North America longer than we have been freed, uh, legally freed. And it's important, and I think Juneteenth gives us an opportunity to do this, to think about what that means. That there was this institution that shaped people's attitudes about black people, that shaped white people's attitudes about themselves. Slavery was racially based, so, a racial hierarchy that was created was really drummed into people and was made to be a part of the natural order. So much so that people don't even recognize the things that they're doing that are in keeping with that, that perpetuate that. So I think one of the things celebrations of Juneteenth can do is to bring this to the fore and to remind people of the fact that we're not so far away from June 19th, 1865. Certainly we're not so far away from the effects and the fallout uh, from that and the reaction to that, which shaped the lives of African-American people for many years after emancipation and the hopeful period of reconstruction uh, came the redemption governments in the South making life as awful for African-American people as they could, trying to bring things as near to slavery as possible. Now, there's, they could do under the law, under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, adopting ways of trying to encode and ensure that white supremacy would remain the order of the day. So writing a book like this is unusual for me because I am a scholar of the institution of slavery and the early American Republic, essentially. I write about the period of the revolution, the colonial period in slavery, but mainly the, the um, period of the revolution up until uh, Andrew Jackson. And I write about Virginia mainly and slavery in Virginia and in Monticello. This is the first time that I've written a book that deals with my home state, Texas. Uh, my editor has been after me for many years now to do a book about Texas, about slavery in Texas, the history of slavery in Texas, and to do something big and sweeping, sort of like the Hemingses of Monticello. But in fact, my first book is this relatively short book, fewer than 150 pages, that is part memoir and part history. I don't really like talking about myself that much. I spend most of my time reading about and talking about and writing about other people's families and other people's gossip and problems and triumphs and tribulations. And not so much about myself. I don't inject myself into that much. But this required me to do that, is to talk about my family. And because I, not something that I wanted to do, I don't think that that's, that alone is enough be enough for me to write a book to tell people about myself, I thought that it should be blended as with the story of Texas, that I would tell the history of Texas through my family as much as I could. And I feel that I can do that because my family has deep roots in Texas. On my mother's side, I can identify a person who was there in the 1820s, 
before Texas was a republic, when it's part of Mexico, and before it's a republic, um, but certainly before it's a state. And on my father's side, I can take things back at least to the 1850s. And my family, an interesting thing about my family on both sides is that they did not join, for the most part, did not join the Black, the Great Migration from the South to the West, lots of people in Texas, to California and Arizona, or, or to Chicago or to New York. They remained in Texas. And if they moved, they moved from small towns and moved into Houston or to Dallas or places there. So I have deep roots in the state and most of my family is still there. <laughs> there I don't have, you know, some people have relatives all over the country. I, I really don't. Most of my relatives, the bulk of them are in Texas. So I thought this provides me an opportunity, gives me an opportunity to, to talk about not just myself, but to tell the story of Texas. And I have wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, Texas is one of those states, maybe a, probably along with Florida, where people wonder what the hell is going on. I mean, people ask me, what's up with this? Explain this place to me. And you know, I, I left Texas as an 18 year old to go to Dartmouth uh, in Hanover, New Hampshire, completely different culture, different folkways, different, mainly different weather. Uh, and I've been on the East Coast since that time. And I've had many occasions for people to ask me, what's up with Texas, what's going on there? And I think one of the problems, one of the difficulties is that people have a mistaken notion of what Texas has always been about. I say in the book that Texas is constructed, is, Texas is a white man in people's thoughts and imagination, a white man symbolizes that state. But I'm a Texan, I'm not a man, I'm not white, uh, family members. Well, what about all the other people in Texas that contribute to making the place what it is? And I talk at the beginning of the book about how movies, how Hollywood has shaped attitudes about Texas, about what it means, you know, cowboys, even though we know that many cowboys were black actually, um, and certainly many of them were uh, Hispanic, uh, the focus has always been on white guys essentially. So what I wanted to do was to construct a book that brought all of the people to Texas, all of the people of Texas together again to make the state complete. Because I think if you understand that Texas is not a white man, <laughs> that it has been diverse from the very beginning, starting with the various groups of indigenous people, some of whose names have been lost, you know, to sort of, if not lost to history, lost to common knowledge, but indigenous people, it's a place of, of Spanish influence. The Spanish came to Texas in the 1500s. My, one of my first chapters, the Africans in Texas talks about Estebanico, who was brought, who was an enslaved man, but he was brought with Cabeza de Vaca and others on an expedition, originally going to Florida and Cuba. They end up shipwrecked on Galveston and walk across Texas almost to California. And Estebanico becomes a translator for, he has a talent for languages, de Vaca remembers and he became a translator for the native peoples and Europeans. He's enslaved, but once you know, all hell breaks loose and they're shipwrecked and they're you know, desperate, things sort of even out. But of course, once they get to a fort, they try to revert to the old ways. So he was not equal when, you know, when everything was all right, when they desperately needed him, all of a sudden he becomes, his stature raises and then it goes back. So I, I talk a little bit about that, but I also talk about the fact that not all of the black people who came with the Spanish 
uh, to Texas and, and Florida and those areas were enslaved. And some of them who were left those expeditions, they went off into Mexico, they founded their own communities, a big community in Veracruz. There's a heavy African influence genetically in Mexico that people don't acknowledge or don't think about very much. It also played a role in slavery in Texas. When you think of people in slavery running away, we think of people following the North Star, going North. But in Texas, enslaved people went South because Mexico outlawed slavery and was the place where they could be free. So I want to try to bring this story, I wanted to bring that story to the fore and get people to understand that Texas, unlike a number of states, Texas did not become diverse. It was diverse from the very beginning. Indigenous people, people of Spanish origin, Anglo Europeans, and African Americans, all in this place from the very beginning. And if you think about Texas just as cowboys or oil men, and you don't think about the fact that there were African American people there, enslaved people there, you don't get, you, I don't think you can really understand the sort of racial dynamic that exists in Texas. I think for many people, Texas is not even, people don't think of Texas as a part of the South. You think about Southern history, you think about Alabama, Georgia, those kinds of places. But Texas is Southern as well. East Texas, where I grew up, uh, has always been the most populous part of the state. West Texas, that creates this image, is the least populous part of the state. Stephen F. Austin, who is considered to be the father of Texas, uh, got the right, actually it's his father who was given the right for Mexico to bring Anglo settlers into Texas, but his father died before he could fulfill this. So Stephen F. Austin, for whom the capital of Texas is named and some universities as well, and many high schools, um, the father of Texas talks about the importance of slavery to the enterprise in Texas, the enterprise of immigration and settlement. And he said in a letter that if white people came to Texas without slavery, they could expect to be poor for a very, very long time because they needed enslaved people to clear the forests. That's the other thing. When people think about Texas, they think about, you know, <laughs> dusty plays, you know, tumbleweeds. The ha if you look at a map of te Texas, a topographical map, the uh, size much bigger than New, New England <laughs> is green. It's essentially a, a, pine, a forest, the piney, you know, the, the big thicket, as it's called. And that had to be cleared uh, because what, what uh, Austin wanted to do and the others who came with them was to make Texas a part of the cotton empire. I mean, I, I think it's another aspect of slavery that people sort of neglect to think about is that it was expansionist. It was not just about being in one place with your slaves. Uh, the Southerners wanted to go West. They wanted Texas, they wanted New Mexico, they wanted Cuba. Uh, and that expansionist impulse was really what caused the tension with the North, uh, the competing labor system, because the, the South was not content. Lincoln says, you know, I'm not gonna disturb slavery where it is. And we hear that and think, oh, all right, so slavery is going to live forever. They hear that and think, Southerners heard that and thought, oh, we're not going to be able to expand and we're going to be stuck here with a rising population of Black people and depleted land, and this can't hold. We have to be able to expand. So Texas is a part of that. And in Texas, we take Texas history twice. We have to take Texas history twice in the fourth grade and the seventh grade. And it is an elective in high school and many people take it. So you could have three years <laughs> of Texas history. Um, and we talked about slavery, but I don't think, I don't recall in my classrooms talking about this aspect 
of the Texas story that it is really created with the idea that slavery is gonna be a central feature of the society there, that it would join the cotton empire. And I wasn't clear, it wasn't clear to me until I was a teenager that Mexico had abolished slavery. And one of the reasons that they were in conflict with the Texians was over this issue of slavery. Now they gave the Texians, as they were called, an exemption because they understood that slavery, all those people came there with the expectation that they would be able to keep their slaves and keep slavery. Um, so they gave them a, an exemption, but the Texians never trusted them on that point. I mean, it was so vital to their economics and their, their economic well being that they didn't want to trust the Mexicans to their promise to let it let things slide. And the move for independence was in part about this. You know, we're taught to be very, very proud of the fact that Texas was a republic. It was its own country for, uh, you know, for a decade. Now, not a very functional one, but it was its own country. And the reason it became its own country was not just about slavery. I mean, there, was a, there were differences in language, uh, religion, Santa Ana, the leader of the country had suspended the constitution, but slavery, the question about the future of slavery was an integral part of that conflict. And so what I do in the book in a chapter called Remember the Alamo is to talk about how slavery complicates that narrative that we were taught in fourth grade and seventh grade history to kind of revere the figures of the people who are, are the figures who are at the Alamo, Jim Bowie, Davy Crockett, William Travis, the commandant, of, um, of, of the Alamo, when in fact, Jim Bowie was a tr slave trader and Barrett, you know, William Barrett Travis owned enslaved people and he was not a great, such a great guy. <laughs> Otherwise he ran off from Alabama and left his young wife and child and came to Texas, you know, to one step ahead of his creditors. And because he has this glorious moment, they have this glorious moment in, at the Alamo, and they, they die, you know, in this, this uh, in, in sort of a blaze of, of uh, defiance, um, they are revered and you're supposed to take a spirit from that. And indeed, uh, a couple of years ago, when members of the democratic delegation in Texas left the state to try to prevent there being a quorum, one of them, and I, I'm almost certain he was an African-American said, this is our Alamo. And so I thought it was quite ironic that he would use, you know, these people are trying to promote voting rights. So he would use the story of these slaveholding people in the alimony and then in the Alamo trying to, 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 trying to hold the fort as exemplifying his spirit. Now, I understand why you can do that. I mean, myths are, every country creates myths. Every society creates myths. We seem, human beings seem to need that for some reason. We gotta have the history, but the myth part of it is, is important to us. It kind of spikes, uh, you know, inspires our imagination and inspires us to, you know, to, to be courageous and so forth. But I, I still think though, you have to tell the truth about all of this. And if you have, as you may have read about the controversy down in Texas and some other places now about how we teach history. What history do we talk about? And some people thought that we don't want to tell people about bad things because it will make them feel bad about the country. Um, you know, history is not just about feeling good. You know, it's not just about the people you like, it's about what happened, you know, and we need to know what happened. So, it's still, I don't know that I come to a, a, a perfect resolution of this, but I'm pointing out the, the sort of tension there between wanting to have mythic heroes and the, the, I think the imperative really of telling the truth, which is an unpleasant truth, that a lot of the reason Texas wanted to break away from Mexico was to preserve the institution of slavery. In fact, and I talk about this in the book, the Texas constitution explicitly promotes slavery. 
and condone slavery. And it says that people of African descent um, can't migrate to Texas, can't live there without permission. You know, the, the United States Constitution kind of fudges on this, talking about persons held to service, but this Constitution is explicit about it. This is what we're here for. And in fact, thinking about Juneteenth, when the war started, the Civil War started, and the Army of the United States began to move across the country, and, you know, they emancipating people after they took control of the space, you know, once that started happening, whites from Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi rushed into Texas. There was a huge surge of people into Texas with their slaves saying, you know, as a last ditch effort to try to maintain their control over these people. So the folks you have in Texas are hardcore is the point. They're the people who left you know, those other Georgia and all those other places to come to Texas to be certain that they would not have their, uh, have enslaved the people they were enslaving, um, enslaving, emancipated. So when Juneteenth rolls around and, you know, they had kept fighting, as was mentioned the about the last battle there in Texas, they kept fighting down to the very, very end. They won the last battle of the Civil War but the war was lost. They understood after Lee uh, surrendered that everything was over essentially. So what you're dealing with are the most hardcore people uh, in the Confederacy in some ways, people that had, had their own country, people who felt that they had never been defeated really in battle and people who had been, you know, sort of, insecure about the institution of slavery forever because of the connection to Mexico, because Mexico could always have had a role to play in whether or not slavery continued. So these are really defiant folks. So June 19th, 1865 rolls around. Gordon Granger arrives in Galveston with troops, Black troops, and you can think about what it must have meant to Black people in Texas, enslaved people, to see African American men in uniform as liberators. Um, the story is told that Gordon Granger supposedly read General Order Number Three from a balcony where he was staying. He may have done that, but it also appears from other accounts that they went around to various parts of the community one African Methodist Episcopal Church, tacked General Order Number 3 to the door, read it. And so they, the soldiers went about disseminating the story that, that, this was, um, uh, that this was coming to pass. Now, when I was growing up, there was sort of a semi-joke about Juneteenth that said, well, you know, Black people were late to the game here. They didn't know. And People would say, well, the uh, enslavers didn't want to, we didn't, we didn't see enslavers in those days, but you know, the owners didn't want to let them go because they wanted an extra harvest or something like that. They, and they kept it secret. But the truth is black people knew about the Emancipation Proclamation and they knew that Lee had surrendered. I mean, enslaved people knew what white people knew because they lived in the houses with them and they listened to them. Some of them could read and you know, there's no way to keep really keep information from enslaved people. In fact, people marveled at the capacity that enslaved people had to pass information um, from, what to, from one person to the next, but for long distances actually. So they knew what was happening. In fact, I, I found one a newspaper account of enslaved people, uh, some uh, people on a dock, black men working on a dock who were celebrating and they asked them, what do you sell? This is before Granger was there. And he said, because we're going to be free. So even before Granger got there, there were people who knew what he was going to say. And he said it, says it, uh, African-American people are jubilant about this. Uh, the white people, not so much. In fact, there are accounts of large numbers of people being whipped for celebrating. 
you know, I mean, just think about it. I mean, before these people had been chattel and they represented property and wealth to people. And now those people were going to have to pay them for their work. And they resented it mightily and did what they could to discourage people from celebrating. Uh, Juneteenth was originally called Emancipation Day, and it was celebrated in churches. And I speculate, I don't know how many way of proving this, but I speculate, I wonder if having them in churches might have been a way to try to make, be as protected as possible. Uh, surely people would not attack you in church. That's not necessarily true, obviously, but uh, they were mainly in churches. And later on, they began to be celebrated in parks as well. One of the most poignant stories, one of the, I think, uplifting stories for me in the book is the story of four Black men in Houston who pool their resources. These are former enslaved people who pool their resources and they buy land in Houston for the express purpose of celebrating Juneteenth. And now just think about this. These are people who, you know, had been treated as chattel and their, their people had been treated as chattel. And they were so convinced that, and, want, and hopeful that people would remember this day that they bought land for the express purpose of celebrating there. So connecting themselves to future generations of people and, and predicting and just assuming that black Texans would celebrate and they have. I mean, and this land became Emancipation Park, which is still in Houston, which I have been to and, and would intend at some point to go to again. Uh, there have been celebrations of Juneteenth there since that opened in the 18th, you know, in the 1860s. And before then, as I said, people celebrated in churches and in their homes. So Black Texans have been doing this now for 156 years. I found a, a video clip, someone posted a video clip of a parade of African-Americans in, in Galveston uh, in the 19, in 19 teens at some point. And they're all in their Sunday best, walking along, waving the American flag and walking in the middle of, you know, this is in Texas. This would not have been uh, a, uh, not a great time uh, for black people in Texas, but that was something that they were going to do and they were determined to do and they've been doing it ever since. Now, I said in the book, at the beginning of the book that when I, first heard that people were celebrating Juneteenth, I had a sense of kind of, you know, hey, wait a minute, this is our holiday <laughs> in a way. This is our Black Texans holiday. What does it have to do with you? And as a kid, I thought of it as, as exclusively a Black holiday. But in 1980, the state of Texas made it a state holiday. So other people celebrated it as well. It became a, a celebration for the entire state. And I changed my mind about ownership of, of, uh, of Juneteenth because it's, it should be marked as a day of, of an advancement in human rights. And we don't really have that many of those. <laughs> uh, we, we don't have those often enough. And so when we have them, we should pause and take note of that and pay attention to that. And that's you know, that's why I, I changed my mind about that and wanting people to, wanting people other than Black Texans to, to celebrate it. I mean, people have been asking me, you know, since the book came out and I've been talking about it, you know, whites have asked, well, how do, how do we celebrate this holiday? Well, I, I think you can celebrate it in sort of the same way. It won't have the same meaning, obviously, um, that it has for the descendants of enslaved people, but as an advance in human rights, that's something that all right thinking people can get on board with. It is a family holiday, as I indicated before, a family and a community holiday. Uh, it's a day to think about history, uh, to use history and to think about use history as a so almost as a as a guide to try to explain where we are. And you can talk to your children about that. You can talk to your family about that, your friends and so forth. There, there are ways to celebrate. You don't have to be 
just the descendant of, of an enslaved people, an enslaved person to do this. It's about progress and a notion of progress uh, uh, for humanity. And that should be the goal. So once, now that we have this federal holiday um, and I was greatly privileged to be able to go to the White House to witness the signing of that. I got a phone call at about nine in the morning saying, if, asking if I wanted to come down. And I said, yes. And then I hopped on, hopped on the shuttle at about 11 o'clock to get down there in time for it. And Opal Lee, uh, who is in her 90s, the Texan in her 90s, who has been campaigning for this for very, very long, was able to make it to the ceremony as well. And it was quite, it was quite moving. Now, the question has been raised, and I think it's a legitimate question, uh, you know, why a holiday? Well, a couple of things. First, you know, is this a commemoration or is this a celebration? You know, things didn't go completely rosily after this happened. It was not, it has been, it has, it continues to be a struggle. So do you want to use the word celebrate? Now I use both. I use commemorate, but there's a celebratory act, you know, aspect to this that I think comes from thinking back to what, trying to imagine what those people at the time felt, how it felt to learn that it would no longer be legal for people to sell your wife, your husband, your children, your sisters and brothers away from you. I mean, it's pretty clear if you look at the narratives of enslaved people and accounts of slavery in general, that you know, whipping is bad, being paid, you know, work for no pay is bad, but the separation of families was the great trauma of slavery. And you can see that after the war is over, there are ads in newspapers that people are taking out. Have you seen my mother? I last saw her here and explaining you know, descriptions of this person. They, people wandered all around trying to gather up relatives. And I also suspect, this is also something that I, is a speculation on my part, uh, but when you go through the airport, <laughs> in the summertime and you see black people with t-shirts on, the Owens family reunion, the Townsend family reunion, that this idea, the importance of gathering up the family, I think probably, I, I don't wonder if that's not a holdover from the trauma of slavery when families were separated. And this notion of coming together is really important to African-American people. And, Juneteenth has that aspect as well, because it is a holiday that, that brings families together and communities together. It's about not just celebrating in your own little home necessarily. It's, it was always, for us at least, it was always uh, a, a, a thing for families to come together and celebrate this particular day um, uh, together. So that part of the, com that component of the story of the holiday is one that recognizes, I think it's appropriate to use celebration to acknowledge what a relief, what that must have meant to people to know that by law, I mean, there were all kinds of problems and, you know, they, but the kind of the notion of putting families up on the auction block to sell them from themselves, that that's over, that's worth celebrating. They were happy about that, about that thing. Now the commemoration, is, is appropriate as well, um, because it's, it's a word that we're taking note of this, but we're not operating under the illusion <laughs> that all became you know, a bed of roses after this was over. And they didn't think it was gonna be because they knew who they had been dealing with in slavery and they understood that there was gonna be hostility. And I refer to that, people got whipped for celebrating but they nevertheless persisted in doing it because it was just that important to them. So celebration, commemoration, both of them work for me. Uh, the important thing is noting, the, noting that this was an important occasion and like those four men who bought the land um, to, to suggest that this is something that future generations should commit to 
and make it a part of their lives because it, it's a, it links you to the story of people of African descent from the very beginning of their time in this country. Now, you know, I, you know, I start off as I, when I talk about Estebanico and Blacks in, in, um, in Texas in the 1500s, 1619 is very, very important uh, because it establishes, I mean, this is the time when we get the beginning of British, the Anglo rule in America, and they won. You know, Spain did not win the contest. France did not win the contest for North America. The British did. So I'm not saying that 1619 isn't important um, it is quite important, but I think coming at this through Texas and the Spanish influence, it's a way of saying that African people were all over the world, you know, doing lots of different kinds of things. And that's a possible origin story for us as well that we can think about when we think about Juneteenth in Texas and the history of slavery in Texas. It's, it ties these things together. I mean, one of the things that people have pointed out is that they're in other places celebrate other days. And how did we come to have Juneteenth <laughs> as the one that gets to be the federal holiday? I think a lot of it has to do with the uh, insistence of people like Miss Lee and uh, the fact that when black people left Texas and went other places, they took the holiday with them. And that's how people in California find out about it and Chicago and other places. And I'm not so sure that, you know, people from other places were as diligent or as you could say stubborn <laughs> about keeping that day alive when they went to their new homes. But Texans did do that. And I think that that's why we have landed on Juneteenth as a day to commemorate uh, the end not of slavery, because as you point, I mean, you know, obviously slavery ends legally with the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865. But I think Juneteenth is important because it comes after the defeat of the military effort to maintain the system of slavery. The Confederates give up the armed struggle over protecting what they consider to be their way of life, which was keeping uh, people as enslaved. So I think, I, I would hope that, that Juneteenth becomes an umbrella for all of these other days. I think there's a day in Virginia, a separate day in Virginia, maybe it's in April and something in Florida and other places. Emancipation, as I said, was a process. It didn't happen in one day. It took time. Many actors, the Army of the United States, African-American enslaved people themselves, who ran away from the institution, ran away from the plantations and helped to break the back of, of the system. And Juneteenth is a, is a time, I think, to celebrate all of that. And you know, it's not, it's not simply a Texas story. I want, I would hope that the other stories of this process of emancipation will be talked about. Juneteenth is a holiday that is tailor-made for history. Uh, and I also hope that and I've sort of said this before, suggested people ask me what can they do in their own homes. One of the things that I hope people will do is to have young people take the histories of older members of their family. And we're past the point of slavery now, obviously, but there are many, many things in history that people are gonna look back on and wanna know about. Say for instance, the pandemic for heaven's sakes, We've gone through this amazing thing over the past couple of years to have the stories of what it was like for your, you know, 100 years from now, or for your grandchildren to know what happened, how you felt, all those kinds of things, I think is really important. And I, it emphasizes that what I did with this book, you could do, anybody could do, to tell the history of where you live through your family, through what was going on and how that affected them. And keeping the history of Juneteenth alive is important, but it's also, I think, important to create new stories and new memories. And this could be a time to make the, the sort of com communion between young and old in the family and in communities as people take oral history and become historians 
and take control of our story. So with that, I'd like to take any questions that there are. Thank you so much for such a just <clears throat> thoroughgoing um, explanation of uh, Juneteenth and its, uh, and its history, its grounding in Texas, and, and, it, and, and also, too, of Texas itself in terms of our, which mm -hmm. in, in helps our understanding of the state, too. Mm -hmm. uh, are there um, any questions from the, uh, in the chat? Okay. Um, well, one of the things that oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that I, I was struck by in your comments were that you know you talked about you know how the experience of people who you know several generations apart from slavery, but yet close uh -huh. to slavery, uh -huh. and then just in how that is sort of implicates the way in which, you know, racism, for instance, and slavery is, you know, so much a part of the American psyche. I mean, mm -hmm. because, you know, with, with its origins in slavery. And I was just struck by that in terms of, could you talk a little bit about that in terms of, say, the, the you know, the fact that, you know, in the broad span of history, you know, say 160 years <laughs> are not a long time ago. No, not a long time ago. And it, it's such a, well, it's such a, it seems so foreign to us, even though there are aspects of slavery still going on today. But the slave system as we knew it, you know, uh, as was known at the time, just seems so foreign to us that you, you sort of put it back to something, you know, that happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but its closeness means that there's no question that my great grandmother's personality and life and understanding about things was shaped by her mother mm -hmm. you know, experienced this institution. And there are probably things that you don't, you, you can't even put your finger on definitely yeah. about the way you view yourself, the way you view white people, uh, the way you carry yourself, all of this, mm -hmm. some of this comes down from all of this. And so I, I think the kind of hidden cultural questions, hidden cultural meanings and understandings that get passed down mm -hmm. um, are things worth pondering, thinking yes. about how this affects us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes me think too, or even of my own grandmother who was born in 1887 mm -hmm. in Virginia, uh, Middlesex County, but whose, mm -hmm. whose mother uh, was born in slavery in 1862. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, just with her sharing that with me in her lifetime, she died in 1979. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of, in a measure that brings it home, mm -hmm. you know, a certain type of way. Yeah. And, you know, and it, particularly if you stay in the places where this took place, mm -hmm. you know, so you're not only, and one of the things that I, I, I definitely want to do, I, I learned so much about my family, much more about my family doing this book, you know, but I, you know, I found my, you know, my great, great grandfather on the slave role, not in the slave role, excuse me, on the voters role. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in 1867, uh, I, I made sense of comments. I remember we took a trip to Madison, Texas, and I, I as a kid with my grandmother, and I didn't know why. But when I was doing the census records here, I found out that my great grandfather lived there for a time. And that, uh, things, pieces of the puzzle come mm -hmm. together. As you, um, as you begin to really search for things. Yeah. But we are such a product of all of these, uh, of these moments and their experiences, and they're very, very close to us. Yes, yes. That was a question that came up in the chat. Um, when did Mexico ban slavery? 1829. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but I said, but gave, um, they had been talking about doing it before then, but they, but they gave the Texians a, an exemption and they never really, as I said, trusted them on that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And um, another uh, question is how do you, I mean, do you know how Juneteenth spread to the rest of Texas? Not precisely other than the grapevine 
that, uh, uh, that worked effectively. And also the mm -hmm. army, the army began to occupy parts of Texas and where the army went, uh, the story went as well, because mm -hmm. once the Freedmen's Bureaus were set up, the Freedmen's Bureau was set up in Galveston and they mm -hmm. had you know, sections in other parts of Texas, they carried the story as well. You know, then, you know, so it was part of the army's duty to do this, but it was also African-American people who carried the story themselves. Mm -hmm. I was struck too by how you, you talked about the heavy African influence in Mexico, which of course also carries over into Texas as well. And it reminded me of, you know, um, of, you know, the discovery back, I think it was in 1963 of these 11 huge um, carved heads uh, that of persons with Africanoid features uh, mm -hmm. were found in Southwest Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that, and I, I think that that's a little known, that's not much appreciated. I mean, in terms yeah. of just that influence. And how would you, I guess, further say, expand on what that influence is in particular as it crosses the border into Texas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's something that I want to learn more about. There's a, a historian, Ben Vincent, who writes about, is a black historian who writes about Mexico and Texas and those places. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these things, this, this was lost. There are groups of people who were runaway enslaved people who joined and who melded into the Mexican population. And there's, mm -hmm. I can't remember what city they're in, but the town they're in, but they have nursery rhymes and songs that have been passed down in their family. They don't know what they mean. They're English, they're in English, uh, but because they're in Mexico and they're Spanish now, um, they are, um, uh, they're not familiar with the words. So you think about people singing songs that they don't know what the meaning of it is, but it came sure. because their ancestors were runaway slaves or, mm -hmm. or people, yeah, and these people, their ancestors were people who left Texas and went into Mexico and made new lives for themselves and just mm -hmm. had kind of lost the fact that, you know, that they have gotten this from, uh, from their ancestors. So this is something that I really, I mean, there's so many things that, <laughs> that happen working on this book that I want to find out more about Galveston. Yeah. You know, Galveston, and my great grandfather, left the farm uh, in East Texas to, mm -hmm. after he planted everything and my great, left my great grandmother and their daughters. They had a son, sons, but they died. And he would hire people to help them. But even going to work on the docks in Galveston, he made enough money to do that and, and you know, make more. And, mm -hmm. you know, I found out that I'd heard that story, but I didn't think anything about it. You know, I just didn't pay any attention to it. And in doing research for this book, I found out that there were lots of black men who worked on the docks there. They actually had a union in the late hmm. 19th and early 20th century. Wow. Uh, and it was a place where there were large numbers of black people and they were considered uppity. Uh, Jack Johnson, uh, the uh, oh, yes. heavyweight boxer was from Galveston. So that's the, you get that kind of attitude uh, mm -hmm. from this place. I want to find out about Galveston. I want to find out more about the blacks going to Mexico. And not just the runaway enslaved people, but the people who came with the Spanish. And mm -hmm. I think Vera Cruz had had a big settlement of people, and there's a heavy African influence there as well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to be discovered from this. So this is a little book that, you know, that was supposed to be a sort of a discreet little thing. But <laughs> now I have uh, so many other projects that I want to look at from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so often the case with scholarship, you know, just, you know, there, there are, you know, other branches <laughs> that sort of kind of emerge from, you know, an initial study, the body of initial study. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm, I'm really amazed about, again, back to Galveston, the big po political, you know, political uh, figures there, Black political figures who served in the legislature and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed by people who did stuff in that time. Mm -hmm. You know, we think of our times as being hard. Yeah. Those were really, really hard times. Mm. And people did, you know, they pieced together what power, what, you know, what agency, whatever you want to call it, that they had 
-hmm. in that context and to still operate under that kind of oppression is just uh, it's it amazes me yeah yeah a couple of other questions have come to us uh several attendees have noted uh, at this event, at our program have noted that this is a history they were not taught and that they've learned so much today well good good not good that they weren't taught it but right. i'm glad that they, uh, <laughs> right. i think they've learned something today yeah uh, another question is why was the emancipation day not chosen for, for the official name of the federal holiday i don't know i think it's because texans wanted juneteenth <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. what that's I mean, we, we switched from Emancipation Day to Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I that's what it's always been known as. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing that's, um, that that struck me as well in your presentation, you talked about the power and the problem of myth mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the mythology related to Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie and the Alamo and the way in which that has become a part of Texas, but also American law. law. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and how, as a historian, um, how do you sort of navigate? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tough one. You know, that's a really, you know, Kendi, but you asked me a really tough question because it's such a powerful need. And we say Americans like myths. Every society has myths. Yeah. Every single one of them. And they serve a psychological and emotional purpose for people. Mm -hmm. So I guess, <laughs> you know, what I try to do, you can go along with that up into a point. Yeah. But when it becomes, and this is, and who knows when the tipping point comes, when it sort of tips over into destructive mm -hmm. lying, yes. destructive hiding things, mm -hmm. then you have to say no. Yes. You know, I mean, if you could say Davy Crockett, Davy Crockett was this, you know, could you know kill a bear with his bare hands. I mean, I mean, you know, stuff that doesn't really matter. <laughs> but when things that things that really count, you can't let you can't let it go. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if people are going to be mad at you for saying it. Yeah. You know, because we're not going to learn, we're not going to move away, on from this if we're not, I think, doing it on the basis of some truth. Yes. You know, so I'm not answering your question because it's just so hard mm -hmm. and it, there's no one, no precise answer to it. It's just that it, you go along with it as long as if you if as long as it's not harmful to people, mm -hmm. I don't I don't really challenge people on every single thing sure but if it's something that's really important mm -hmm. um you have to say nope nope that's that's not it you know, oh, these I are not people who are yeah. fighting just for freedom they may be fighting for their freedom but they're also fighting to enslave other people and we can't mm -hmm. you you do violence to the lives of the people who were living under that system if you don't say that right right no, I think he did indeed answer the question. I mean, it, by just, I mean, acknowledging the difficulty <laughs> of it. I mean, that's real, you know. I mean, but I think it too is also related to the, the current dynamics at work now in terms of this effort to really suppress history. Mm -hmm. um, the, these, um, ban the banning of books and the, um, even the banning of certain certain um, names, yeah. you know, um, in this effort to really to hold on to myth. I mean, it's an extension of the mythology. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, his, historians are trying, historians are trying to inject history into spaces that have been occupied by myth mm -hmm. and people resent that. And so, yeah, you just have to keep fighting against that, you know, and, and to say, look, the history of Texas is intimately tied up in the history of slavery. Yes. And slavery was racially based. It created a racial hierarchy. And now we have people and we continue to have people who feel that this should be treated as a white man's country mm -hmm. and a white man's government and don't want the former, the descendants of former slaves to be real citizens and vote. 
Um, mm -hmm. That's just the truth that we have to, to deal with and, and to recognize and to see where all of this, the origins of all of this. Sure, sure. Well, any, any closing remarks for us, you know, as we... Uh, no, it's just enjoy Juneteenth and get together with your family and tell these stories and keep the stories of enslaved people alive as much as we can, because that's the only thing, you know, we can't repay them. They are gone, mm -hmm. but our duty is to make sure that they're not forgotten and yes. that their struggles and their hopes uh, were not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, you know, hope is found in struggle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to to, um, you know, continue, you know, the, you know, to really to ponder and to work on what the nature of freedom is in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank for you. Thank you for discussion. inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we thank our audience for having joined us this afternoon as well. And we hope that you will participate in the um, other events of Juneteenth, which are taking place in our community and, and those which will be taking place over this weekend at the Southside Community Center mm -hmm. as well, which are uh, been advertised under a different cover. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, thank you all for coming uh, and joining with us this afternoon. Thank you again, Professor Gordon Reed for, mm -hmm. your, for your conversation with us. Thank we, you. Uh, we look forward to um, seeing